Well, Happy New Year. Oh, my gosh. New Year's resolutions time, huh? I want to travel more. <laughs> and I want to lose 10 pounds. And I am going to travel more. I'm going to actually be taking a trip to um, to New York, January 24th. I'm going to, I think I leave on the 23rd, and I get there on the 24th. That's it. I'm going to fly over on United and fly back on Hawaiian Airlines because they have a direct flight from New York to Honolulu. I've never done that one before. That'll be an interesting one. Going to the Grammys, and I got nominated for a Peace Award, and I'm going to go to, I have a, tickets to see Elton John at Madison Square Garden. It's going to be um, party, 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 <laughs> and cold, cold, cold. I'm I'm not used to that. I've been to New York just once years and years and years ago. So it'll be kind of a trip. And Kathy Takushi, my co-host, is somewhere down that lazy river. Um, she went to on the Ama Waterways River Cruise, and she's cruising. Um, she landed in, in, uh, in Vietnam, I believe, and she's doing a cruise, and she's going to go to Angkor Wat in Cambodia and do all kinds of exciting things for a couple of weeks. So there you go. And I am thrilled to have in the studio here someone who I've known, but I never knew the other side of her. It's so funny how connections are on this island. Um, I do yoga at the Y, and Jennifer is usually sitting right by me, and she does her yoga. She's a very smart, cool lady. And um, I didn't realize, and I've interviewed Malia before, and I've seen her at the station here before because she, she does a lot of great other things, but I didn't know that she was Jennifer's daughter. And I just found this out because Jennifer talked to me about her in her new book, um, uh, Left at Hiva Oa. Is that, am I pronouncing it right? Yes. Hiva Oa. And, and um, it's an amazing story, but I, it's, it's, that's why I thought it'd be good to start the year out. I mean, a lot of work in this novel. Novels are a lot of work. Um, not that, any book is a lot of work, really, right? But yes. but novels take a lot of work. How many years did you do putting in the efforts and research for making this novel a reality? That's a great question. You know, I got started on this in November of 2014. And I what I really got into the main writing of it, I'd had some ideas and some outlines but I don't know if you've heard of this. November is National Novel Writing Month. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. And it, that. it happens every year. And it's essentially a online community that you can join for free. And the goal is NaNoWriMo, they call it for short. The goal is to write 50,000 words in 30 days. And wow. That's a lot of words in 30 days. It's 1,667 per day. <laughs> so how many pages is that? It came out to maybe about 180 on a Word document. Pages? Yeah. Well, that's a lot of writing. Yes. I mean, I do seven or eight pages a day, but my gosh, I mean, that's, I'm shocked that, that's a lot of work. How many hours? That would take me, oh, a couple hours. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you done that? Yes. So what happened was I had the ideas for Left It, Hiva Oa, and I was working on putting some pieces together, and a friend in L.A. was participating in this Nano Remo, and she said, you should sign up. And it was October 30th or something, and I said, okay. So I did. And for me, it was really great to have the goal and the deadlines to keep me at it. Yeah, you know, I can um, get that. I can yeah. get that. So it was uh, – how many hours a day, really, did you put in about for that? Well – Probably two, but not every day. So, you know, mm. on the weekend, I might do six or eight. <laughs> and on a weekday. You do that much? Oh, yeah. I'm trying to get to those numbers um, to get it out. So I can't imagine writing for six or eight hours. I've never oh, done yeah. that. Yeah. It, it, well, that's the good thing about having a goal <laughs> and yeah, a deadline. No, you know, I kind of work like that. Mm -hmm. I mean... I, I want to lose 10 pounds by the time I go to, right? <laughs> I go to New York, maybe it'll work. Uh, but, but on writing, I usually don't have goals, but I do have the habit of writing every single day. Yeah, that's excellent. And that adds up, I mean, because I've been writing every day of my life since I've been 13 years old. Wow. So I added, tried to add, that's a lot of years, and um, it's over, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 or something. Things, but but the thing is, in the beginning, that was so long ago. There wasn't computers. I literally lost. I mean, I have somewhere tons of journals, but I mean, 
when you look at that, there's no way you can take those journals and make them all and, and translate them all into the computer. So now I, I actually do it on my iPhone. Oh, yeah. Then it's already there, and then I can just send it to my computer. Yes. And once it's on the computer, then it goes to Word Doc, and then it's easier. But when you're doing a goal like this, you want to just be on the computer going for it because you don't even have the time to do that. Right. Yeah, and I'm a pretty fast typer, too. I'm waiting for the day when ideas go straight from my brain into the computer. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Well, that's what musicians do when they go straight and they play an instrument, right? That goes right from their brain to their instrument. Sure. uh, The only way to do that, and some people do, but I can't. Some people actually just talk into their recorder or their phone. Mm -hmm. And I know some people who actually do whole books by just talking it. But I'm much more internal with it, and I, I don't think I could talk a book like that, sure. you know? Yeah. I could talk to another person like that, but I don't think I could talk to my recording right. device quite the same way. There's something that happens when you get in that mindset. Literally, your mind kind of, it's almost like you go into, not a daydream, but another state. Mm-hmm. And you actually go to that place. Mm-hmm. From you, it's even more so with the novel. I kind of go into a higher place inside. I kind of have my inner voice talking to my outer voice. But when you do a novel like this, I mean, my gosh, it took you how long when you're doing this this project of how many, (laughs) of about two hours a day, but how many pages a a day again? Right. So maybe three or so. But what I wanted to share is that that's when I kind of got the meat of it out, 50,000 words. Uh The entire novel is about 68,000. Okay. Uh So to give you a little context. So after November of 2014, um, they recommend you put it aside for a little bit (laughs) and then go back to it. Uh And I did. And then it was about two and a half years of revising, um, adding to it, editing when I had the time. Did you edit it yourself? No, I hired someone. Yeah, it's very hard editing yourself. Oh, yeah. Because you think of it and you don't see things that other people see because you, you, you... Typed it and you think it's fine. Exactly. In your mind, it's fine. Right. But there's when, no way. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way. But it's expensive getting it. Editors are not cheap. Sure. But for me, it was worth the investment. You know, this is um, something I've wanted to do for a long time. And when I went for it, I was going to give 100%. You know, I didn't want a typo to show up five no. years from now. <laughs> so. Did you find a, an editor here on Maui? Yeah. Her name is Lourdes Bernard, and she is with Comma Sense editing really oh. cute <laughs> and she um, was part-time between New York and here uh-huh. and then moved back to Maui full-time this about two years ago so I worked with her over that period she actually read it about three times um, to go through and edit for me it, it takes about that and it's mm-hmm. expensive how much did it cost you to edit oh gosh you know all together with the three passes maybe about a thousand dollars that's actually very good. Yeah, might I might be forgetting something. There, no, but, but that's <laughs> that's that's very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. So it was to me worth it. Yeah. you know, because um, I wanted it to be a professional. Well, piece. definitely. Now, did you do it as a? It's a, it's a soft cover. Did mm-hmm. you do it create space or how did yeah. you? Yeah, I mean they're pretty easy to work with if you have it, but they have to then take what you have and put it into the format that's going to work as well. So it has right. to be reformatted, right? Right. There's some pieces you format and some pieces that they kind of make it work and fit yeah. together. So, like, you you let them know how many pages it's going to be and the size you want. and um, Or actually, you let them know the size, the specs, you know, the height and width, and then they'll tell you how many printed pages it will turn out to be. And then there's the cover and everything, right. too. Yeah. I designed the cover and um, and did all the interior design and layout and everything myself. Okay, now this is the travel show, so here's yeah. where the travel part <laughs> comes in looking at it. Uh, you have a lovely picture, a map that's in a nice color. I like this blue you chose. And folks, this is not always easy to decide what colors and things, but each of these makes a difference. I mean, you did the right thing. On a, on a book, you want the title to be bold, and you did that. There's no distractions from the title. I, I took me years to learn that. I'm still trying to get that down. And um, you picked the Marquesas Islands and... Um, also, you see here French Polynesia, and it's kind of in Papeete. I was just over there. I was just in Papeete yeah, a couple I, months ago. I heard ago. that in your show about it. Yeah. And, and Tahiti is amazing. So, this is is this an old map or is this a current map? Did you you found a map that actually has currents, which makes sense because this actually has to do with what you'd want yeah. if you were actually running or doing a, a canoe or a ship yes. or. Yeah. So did you get a, a special map that, that actually navigators would use? Well, let me tell you my 
design secret. Uh -huh. <laughs> I actually, um, that's actually from a photograph, and the photograph is from an atlas, National Geographic atlas. Uh -huh. I took a picture of that page, and in the process of writing this book, I was going back and forth looking at that page all the time. Because oh, really? Hiva'oa is an island in the Marquesas. I was, and, yeah. Yeah, and so that's where um, a certain turns of events happen in the book. <laughs> and so I wanted that to be depicted somewhat in the cover, you know. And I liked the kind of old look that it has. Like it has some navigational it attributes to it. It's yeah. not just like a touristy map or something like right. that. Right. And so that's what made me um, say this could work for a photo for the for the cover. I wasn't in Hiva Oa. I was in Hulahina. Mm -hmm. So Hiva Oa is above Bora Bora, kind of? I think so. It looks kind of like it's above Bora Bora, but this might be Morea. Christmas Island's way off to the top. Right. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's a little ways. I mean, have you ever been there? Did you go there? <laughs> No, and that you is really a have dream. To go there. <laughs> I know, I know, and it's so difficult to get there. Is it? You know, I mean, from what I understand, you can go on a freighter yeah. to get there, um, or maybe it's some special chartered flights or that kind of thing. I think you have to go to Tahiti, yes, and then go from there. And so, um, I did look into it, and you know, it's not cheap, but uh -huh. <laughs> it's kind of a life dream to go and see the places that you know, are mentioned here in the book. Well, it's time, I guess, to talk about why you have these exciting islands um, and, and rather exotic islands, very sure. different than actually the Hawaiian islands, yeah. um, and where that came from. Tell me, um, where'd you get the story from? Okay. Well, this story, actually, I had someone else ask me, when did you first feel inspired to write this story? Mm -hmm. And when I thought about it, I realized that I've sort of been telling this story my whole life, but... I never knew the whole story, mm -hmm. okay? And it's based on a true story about my dad, um, Captain Ken Bolin. And he, when he arrived in Maui, worked as the harbor pilot here oh, at Kahului Harbor really? for 15 years. Yeah. And so as harbor pilot, um, he, I call it an analogy as being like a valet for ships. So they go out. I like and that term, <laughs> a valet for ships. Then, then you know what I mean when they I say do. a valet it's for ships. It's a great term. Great <laughs> you, term. They bring it in, park it at the dock. You yeah. know, and because ships come from all over the world, they don't know every harbor and the intricacies. So, so he did that. Um, and, and his education and his training, he went to the um, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, Long Island, New York. And there they um, go to school and basically come out with a, at an officer level, and then they're required to serve some time in the Navy. And, um, and many of them go on to work in the Navy or to have careers as captains for cargo ships. Um, the merchant marines are really focused on doing a lot of um, deployment and moving of equipment and men and, and women, I guess, <laughs> service folks um, for preparing for wars or, you know, different things wherever we are in the world. That's what the merchant marines help to support. Well, so, you know, I have to tell you a story here. Yeah. I had, I, I've lived for the last, in two different locations overlooking the harbor. First, was right up off uh, Lina, Lu, Lina, Lola, Lina Lula. I am forgotten. It's been years now. <laughs> but the second one is now over at the islands. But I've been able to see the harbor um, on that one that's right above um, the high school. And I was just a block up. And I literally have a view of the harbor. And I used to love watching the tugboats and the, the pilot ships coming in and out. And I heard that there's actually a, uh, a woman um, who's been in charge of doing the pilot ships. Okay. For I a didn't while know now, that. yeah, That's great. yeah, um, but but I had never actually been in the harbor. But Regent mm -hmm. Ship is is there for a couple of days, uh -huh. and I went over and I was able to go into the harbor. I was shocked because number one, you have to walk a long distance; right. it's way in there. Um, and then I saw some of the little ships, and it's like, wow, some of these little pilot ships are mm -hmm. are small yep. here. Not mm -hmm. always, and I've travel a lot and sometimes the pilot ships are big but right. I've always thought these people are very very brave people <laughs> and people don't realize that and that they're putting their life on their lines but I always make a point whenever I'm traveling on a cruise line to watch that the pilot ships come in yep. and uh, people don't really know much about what it takes to to do that job but some of these have to get out there in the rough waters Right. At the crack of dawn or before. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they essentially will meet the ship outside the breakwater mm -hmm. and 
oftentimes they throw a rope ladder over the rail <laughs> and the pilot has to climb up the ladder, get on deck, and then they go up to the bridge where they assume command and take the ship in. And, and then they do the same on reverse. Did you ever do out. this as a child? Did you ever go, go, get to go out with your dad? I got to. Actually, at the time we had um, the, um, oh, the Constitution was one of the cruise ships that wow. came, and the Independence. I don't know if you remember them. Wow, Those were yeah. the twin, they called them the white ships that came uh-huh. every week, like we have the ships now coming uh-huh. in. And so it was a real treat when our dad took us on there for lunch or something wow. one day. Well, I mean, I was about eight or nine. Oh, and you <laughs> yeah. still remember, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was really neat. You were really yeah. impressed with yeah. it, the way yeah. it is? It's, yeah. it's, it really I mean, I, I think there's such a romance about it. So obviously... You, did your father talk to you about stories about this? Okay. So here's, um, going back to the book, mm-hmm. basically I knew part of this story, but I didn't know the whole thing until I started digging into it. And mm-hmm. my mom was a great help for this because she had a box of his um, old Navy records and stuff like that that mm-hmm. I could kind of go through and piece it all together. He died in 1993 mm-hmm. when I was 21. So it's um, as kids, you know, he told us bits and pieces, but not a whole lot. And so essentially the story as I knew it was that he and some friends, after graduating from college, they saved their money and they um, left their illustrious careers with the merchant marines um, behind Mm -hmm. to buy a sailboat and sail around the world. Mm. That was their dream. And That's got to cost a fortune. Well... Depends how you do it. Yes, it does. I get that. Absolutely true. It does depend this how you do it. This was in about 1960, 1961. Uh-huh. And so they set out from Annapolis, Maryland, uh-huh. and um, and left from there. And things didn't work out. This is all I knew at the time mm-hmm. until about three years ago. Things didn't work out, and he ended up leaving, um, kicking off his crew in the Marquesas Islands. And rather than continue around the world since he was alone at that point and going most um, around the world. You can't do it by yourself. Well, there's a couple things about that that <laughs> I'll share. But, you know, typically they'll go south toward Tahiti, uh-huh. um, Samoa, New Zealand, Australia, and the Indian Ocean. That's the around the world um, route. But because he was alone in the, leaving the Marquesas, he said, I'm just going to go to Honolulu. It's shorter mm-hmm. for a solo sailor, and then I'll just kind of regroup there. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and then, so he did. And That's he, a long, long, long cruise. Well, it was on average 18 to 20 days. Yeah. It took him 27 days. Mm. And so that's the story I knew growing up, that he left behind his crew, sailed alone. It took him 27 days, and he made it to Honolulu. And that's kind of all I knew, you mm-hmm. know. And going back, I found out more. But, but the kind of neat ending part of the story, well, midpoint of the story really is he ended up in Honolulu he met my mom about a oh. year and a half later and she was living and there stayed. yeah she yeah. was raised on Oahu and he ended up staying and and getting married and having kids and all of that so if certain things on this journey had not happened as they had right. <laughs> I wouldn't be here today exactly. talking with you so it's just kind of a neat family story oh in yeah that way. yeah so so this had always been curious to you mm-hmm, right and you kind of started digging in. Yes. So what happened was I had some good friends that were here living on Maui, and they had just bought a boat themselves and mm. were going to go to the Florida Keys and live on board there mm-hmm. and travel the world and whatnot. So I told the story to them as what I just told to you, the very mm-hmm. nutshell, what I knew about it. And Johnny said to me, you should write a novel about that. And I said, I always thought someday I would. Mm-hmm. Well... On the wall in my kitchen, I have this framed little, it's a card actually that I saved and framed and hung it up. And it says, someday is made up of a thousand tiny nows. Mm -hmm. That someday is not guaranteed, right? right? And I think part of my motivation too is, I'm not quite there yet, but my dad did pass away when he was 57. Mm -hmm. That's young, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to do this, why not now, right? Mm -hmm. And I had some flexibility with my schedule and I just started writing, and then that um, November Nano Remo came up, and so I really put the pedal to the metal, if you will, and you know, kind of got a lot of it out during that. Um, but anyway, so through the process, and actually, I was in a yoga class one day, mm-hmm. and <laughs> when I was first thinking of ideas, and kind of all these scenes started popping into my head. You but know, you can actually see them. Yeah, what would happen if 
this or who would he talk to about that or, you know, and... You had basic names that were real names. Did you decide to use the names of the people that were actually there? Kind of Mm -hmm. 50-50. One of the really cool things about this, and I give my mom a lot of credit also for this, but she she is kind of, as you know, very friendly and outgoing and a master networker in a non-networking way. I think that um, back in the old days, it was just called etiquette, (laughs) you know, (laughs) talking with people and connecting people and remembering people. And so one of the people that he started this journey with, um, my mom reconnected with in Honolulu later, Jean, and they still exchange Christmas cards 50 years later, she and Jean. So I was able to write to Jean and ask her some questions about the trip and she wrote me back and then we talked on the phone and now she's like a, you know like another grandma or something to me mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so it's been really neat to connect like that and that's where I started to get more information unfortunately she did not keep a journal um, but she had some some stories to share with me too and it a novel is made up of characters that are really interesting and in kind of getting to know them. So most people don't get to know each other as much as you have to get that connection going in a book because you really have to get inside people's heads yeah. to kind of make a story work, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. there was also the adventure. Had you even been to Tahiti? Had you been to – you hadn't even been to Tahiti? <laughs> oh, my gosh. You have to go to Tahiti. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you have to, and then you have to figure out if you can get away. I'm sure there's some people with boats and charters and things that would take you over there, yeah. or maybe a ferry or something from Bora Bora or Morea or something. Yeah. But, um, but, but so, so where did the the actual thread start to weave in? Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot between an idea and then having to really make this happen, and and it's it's basically that story you've said where he he goes, but you have to spend some time building his character up first right. as what he was doing here, yeah. which might have been the easiest part because you actually knew that mm-hmm. somewhat. Yeah. What yeah. year was he What year was he doing this here on Maui as a, a, a pilot ship? He, um, we came to Maui in 1974, and he started that in 1976. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. until 1991. Yep. And that was still a lot of growth going on, but a lot still so much smaller. Yes, absolutely. We then. used to go to the harbor all the time and there were, there was no security like yeah. there is now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was actually one of the founding members of the Hawaii Pilots Association. Wow. Pilot number seven. Um, prior to that, he, it was a state job. So he would go into yeah. the office and sit there from eight to four and go home. And then if ships came in in the middle of the night, he was still on call. Mm-hmm. So by them becoming an independent organization, you know, they just worked from home, basically, and went to the harbor as needed. And, and that's still in existence today. Really? Out of Aloha Tower on Oahu, that's where their office is. How many pilots are there now? Do you have any idea? Oh, gosh, you know, I meant to look at that. There At the time, there were maybe eight. Um, wow. Yeah, they have several for Honolulu and then the Outer Islands. How do they one. determine who, the pay? Do you get paid extra if it's in the middle of the night? Or how, I mean, it's got to be interesting. It's an interesting you job. Know, I don't know. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know anything about I mean, how they're paid. These, these, these people are really, and I, again, I was amazed that there's a woman that's doing it and, mm-hmm. and does it now. But, I mean, th- these people to me are kind of heroes. That people yeah. don't realize how courageous they have to be. Right. I mean, you know, it, we know our Coast Guard's very courageous, but mm-hmm. this is taking it. Like to the waters and steps beyond, like where you say you literally are climbing up the side of ships and right. all kinds of weather and darkness and, and, and things like that. Crazy stories, too. I remember, um, well, after he died, we found several letters from captains oh. um, saying, Thank you, you saved my ship and my, really? my tush <laughs> when that stormy day when we were coming into Kahului mm-hmm. and by his navigating, you know, they got in. Um, securely. Wow, that's um, nice that there were letters. In. Yeah, it was wow. neat. And then also the one really funny story is he, a lot of tin plate ships used to come here bringing metal for the cannery mm. and um, also and a lot of Japanese fishing boats would come in and um, when, one night he had taken a ship out and a, sh- a fishing ship from Japan and he came home, was in bed and got a call about three hours later that they needed him to come back down to the harbor well, the cook had been locked in the freezer. What? <laughs> and someone found him. What? <laughs> and he needed to go to the hospital. So, um, so you know, there's 
they had, they I, had to go bring the ship wondered, back in. <laughs> kind of wonder about this. Like, wait a second, how did yeah. you get locked in the freezer? Well, I think there's a little R and R that happens <laughs> when they're in Maui and <laughs> at Doc. <laughs> so, anyway, but that's strange. That's a funny story. But you have that story in the book. No, I don't. But what oh. what I wanted to share, actually, you mm-hmm. talked about the thread through the mm-hmm. story. And so I knew that this, um, there, there was one incident he did tell us about in the book um, when, while he was at sea with this, on this around the world journey. Mm-hmm. And I wanted the book to start with that. Mm-hmm. And someone goes overboard is mm-hmm. what happens. And so that's chapter one. Mm-hmm. And the first words of the book are man overboard. Mm-hmm. And... I wanted to start there, but really in the timeline of the whole novel, that's the middle. Mm -hmm. And so then chapter two goes backwards into some stories from his past, which were mostly true stories that he told us growing up um, and things that happened. He grew up in Massachusetts in a very small town in a farming community. And so then it goes back and forth between his growing up and then his time at sea when he's alone sailing these 27 days um, from the Marquesas to Hawaii. And that was why it took me two years to finish the book because making those timelines Mm -hmm. match up and in the end they blend together and then it all, you understand how it all works Mm -hmm. out. Um, But it was a real challenge. I get the sense that you're a very visual person. Yeah. And, and, And if you're visual, I think it's a lot easier to write because you're kind of seeing it. Yes. And sensing it. And um, that's what you need to do when you're reading a book. You've got to really kind of picture it, make yourself right yeah. there, you yeah. know. And if, if the visuals are there. I mean, almost when I'm hearing you think, oh, this would be an interesting movie, you know. This would make a, a, a... – did you ever Some think Some people that? have told me that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people who have read it have said that. Yeah, and, you know, um, another challenge with it, definitely on visual, but I had to figure out what challenges would he face what joys would he experience uh-huh. while he's at sea, you know, and um, and then how would he deal with those things, mm-hmm. you know? I've never sailed 27 days. No. I've only sailed for a couple hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've never, you know, traveled alone for that long. So what goes through your mind? What, you know, what experiences do you have while you're out there? Mm-hmm. So, so I got to be very creative about those pieces because while well, he had told us some stories about his childhood or the person going overboard, things like that, he never shared um, this was what it was like when I sat there all day <laughs> mm-hmm. wondering where I was in the middle of the ocean. You know, like some of those kind of bigger They, they didn't questions. have the radar back then like that we have now either, did they? I think they had some forms of it. I know that he at the um, Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy, they taught and he learned um, celestial navigation. Oh, and that's And they're handy. one of the few schools that still do that. Today. Really? Yeah. And I think it's great because for any science, even when you have the technology, it's great to know the basis of where that comes from. Did right? you ever see the Hokulea? Oh, yes. And I that haven't. Was wonderful. It must have yeah. made you wonder when you saw mm-hmm. that. It's like... Kind of in the beginning of about three years ago. Well, before they started their around-the-world journey, they came on their tour of Hawaii, and I got to see them at Ma'alaya. And I have an um, old classmate from high school who was on board, and so we got the tour and whatnot. But it was really neat to follow the Hokulea in that journey mm-hmm. while I was writing this book mm-hmm. also. So, you know, just what it's like when you're out there and you cannot see land. <laughs> and you're well, just, plus it was longer than he figured. So it's not yeah. just that. you got to have food, right. you know, and enough water. Mm-hmm. And if you start going 10 days over your right. planned time, you're in trouble, right? right? And cigarettes. <laughs> back, wow, I hadn't thought then. about that. I hadn't even <laughs> considered that. Not that I'm a proponent of that. Yeah, but, I know. Um, you know. There were stories about the cigarettes, too. (laughs) Well, you know, I have never read Jack London much, but when I lived in Sonoma County, there's this beautiful Jack London. I hope it didn't get burned. I don't think it did in that fire. Uh, Jack London's estate, strangely enough, had gotten burned down at one time. But um, he has a beautiful place in Glen Ellen. He had a beautiful place, and you can wander through it. I I I don't think it was burned. But, you know, he built his, most of his stories was. He was a navigator. He loved to sail. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his books were really based around his adventures around the world uh, Mm -hmm. from his sailing trips. And and there is that romantic side of the adventure of traveling and the courage it takes and the, you know, I don't know. You know, to throw yourself into that and to be able to do it takes a certain kind of psyche. Did you ever figure out what it is that drives someone to, to kind of, have 
kind of a lifestyle that's not your typical lifestyle at all? Do you ever right. kind of get in what makes drives them to be that way? Yeah, I read an article in National Geographic, this was maybe three years ago, but they were posing the question about adventurers and explorers and do they have a different something different in their DNA mm. that makes them want to do that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a conclusive answer in the article, but it really got me to thinking. And with, and then I kind of thought about our history as many Americans who came over from another country probably had a little bit of that in them. You know, they might have good point, yeah. left for other reasons too. Mm -hmm. um, but with my dad in particular, he was very adventurous and as this sailing adventurer <laughs> shows. <laughs> and I have that in me, too, in terms mm -hmm. of a natural curiosity. And it's, I can be exploring. I went to Scotland earlier this year. And, How was it? Oh, it was great. And I, was I was there once. I want to go again so badly. It's beautiful. Yeah. It was fun. It was... What time um, of year? End of September, early October. Good time. A little cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I went up to Isle of Skye. Oh, you did? Yes. What was that like? It was neat. It didn't feel like an island because it was very big. Oh. Like, you know, oh. we were inland and stuff like that. Um, but there were coastal areas we went to, although it's smaller than Maui. But, you know, it just, I thought it would be more like a little, like going to Catalina or something. It's kind of, you know? it's kind that, that, it kind of is an ancient feeling and it's yeah. kind of got its own sense of history. And, yeah, and absolutely. Because it is kind of, and it's, it's kind of. It's got some interesting people that it, they're part of the history, too, from what I can tell, right? Yeah, and you feel like you're kind of at the end of the world, yeah. you know, that you're very remote there. Yeah, yeah. But what, while I was there, every time we, I did, um, I was on my own for part of it and on a tour for part of it. Mm -hmm. And any time we had a chance to um, get dropped off and go explore or whatnot, I just always found myself thinking, okay, I'm just going to go around this one more bend. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep going till I see what's around the next bend. Mm. You know, I just had this curiosity that I have to keep going and see until I was the last person back on the bus, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. If you're just tuning in, I'm talking to Malia Bolin. She has a new book out called Left at Hiva Ua, and um, her father was a pilot captain um, in Kaluri Harbor in the late 60s. Early 70s, 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 80s. For how many years? 15 years. 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then did a trip down to just above Tahiti at Hiva Ua um, with a crew and then came back on his own. Um, and and by the way, we, we should say where this book is available. Is it on Amazon? Yes, and at Friends of the Library in Kaahumanu. I love that place. Yeah, that's great. I really do enjoy that place. Have You, you did a, a book, book signing, signing there, didn't there. you? Yeah, mm-hmm. In yeah, November. that's that's it's so nice. I mean, thank God for those people who do that. Good people down there who volunteer their Absolutely. time, and they have a lovely Hawaiiana section, yes, by the way, too. They have a great selection. Okay, so we're gonna do. I think at this point now, you know, we got another twenty minutes or so. Um, let's do a talk from the book. Let's have you sure. do a reading because truthfully, I haven't read this book, <laughs> and I really want to. And um, I mean, this is really gonna be a, a very good book to read. I think. By the way, do you have it on Kindle or is it just on the... Yeah, uh, you can download it. You can oh, get you it can. on Amazon. Oh, good. Or the um, Kindle. Yep. Good, because well, I, th I think this would be a good one. I think this would be a nice Christmas gift, but since Christmas is over, how about a New Year's, <laughs> New Year's gift? Absolutely, for the <laughs> sailor or adventurer in your life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to maybe get this for someone who I think would enjoy it. Okay. Okay, so what are you going to read to us? Okay, so this is... As I mentioned, um, the chapters go back and forth, and we're going from the past and then into present time, mm -hmm. and then we kind of, that meets up, and then we go off into the future of 1962, so it's really still the past. <laughs> but this is a chapter where he's at sea, and he's alone. and He's coming back from um, Tahiti. Yes. So, and actually, his route, just to be clear, they left out of Annapolis, Maryland. Oh, right. And they went south through the Caribbean and then ah. to Panama. Oh, wow. And through the Panama Canal. And then, so that's a typical around the world route and through Panama to the Galapagos. And then the Marquesas. That's not easy sailing down there. No. And, you know, I um, it was really neat when I was. Thank God for the internet. <laughs> I didn't have to go to yeah. the Panama Canal. <laughs> I could watch it. <laughs> on. I watched so many sailing maneuvers on YouTube and them going through the um, Panama Canal to just see what – he talked about that, you know, how neat it was, but I could never picture it in my mind until I saw it on the videos. And uh -huh. so um, – and then he came out of there. So 
in the Marquesas Islands is where things, he was done with his crew, he kicked them off, and then he sailed on to Hawaii from there by himself. And so this is a piece there, so I'm going to go ahead and start. And yeah. um, so picture it, April 1st, 1962, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The Gracias and I were having a fine day. Sometime in the night, we had... Oh, wait, wait, before <laughs> people don't know, the Gracias is the ship. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So he's aboard the Gracias. It's a 40-foot schooner. The Gracias and I were having a fine day. Sometime in the night, we had crossed the equator again, and now southerly winds were pushing us along at a good clip, at least eight knots. Feeling the wind in my hair and the sun on my bare chest, I stood at the helm with a smile on my face. Now this was sailing. The Gracias moved out smoothly, sails bellied, enjoying a full wind. I swore she was smiling, too. All around us was deep, dark blue ocean. Despite the wind, the seas were calm, and we easily slipped over each small crest as the current pulsed below us. There was not a cloud in the sky above. Yes, this sea was meant to be sailed. The sun was now almost directly overhead, and there was a rumble in my stomach. Had so many hours passed as I stood here, holding her steady? We'd been cruising smoothly for so long that the small splash from the starboard rail surprised me. Maybe a rogue bit of wave? Moments later, a spray of salt water splashed my face. In the water there, I saw a dark gray shadow, a fish of some kind, moving with us, keeping pace with the boat. Another spray came across the deck, and this time I looked quickly enough to catch a glimpse of a gray, shiny skin and a sliver of dorsal fin. It sank back into the water, and I saw a second shadow beside it. The shadow moved to come up out of the water, taking a smooth leap over the surface and then back down with a squeak of its beak. Porpoises. They were matching the Gracias's pace, swimming on her starboard side. At least a dozen of these marvelous creatures came alongside, alternating turns at jumping up out of the water. Long and lean in all forward motion, one hopped up, easy as a deer springing over a fence, and slipped back into the sea. As soon as its nose touched the water, another flew forward, taking its turn at a jump. In this way, they progressed among the set of them, up and down and back and forth, like a piano player hitting the keys in perfect succession. The wind was holding steady, but as a precaution, I reefed at the sails. These were the first friends I had seen in days. I didn't want to miss a thing. Lunch could wait. I locked the tiller at the helm and went to the forward storage compartment, where I dug through my gear and pulled out my mask and snorkel. My little pot of friends had doubled. There were at least two, maybe three dozen sleek gray forms rising and falling through the air all around the Gracias at varying intervals, like the horses on a merry-go-round. Several moved forward, and keeping pace with the Gracias, made a weaving pattern across her bow and back again in an intricate dance with her and each other. It was a wonder to watch. I secured a line around my waist and wrapped the end around a cleat on deck. I wanted to see more of this. With the Gracias healing slightly port, I lay down on my stomach on the forward port deck and shimmied over the edge until my torso stuck out above the water. I pulled down my face mask and fell forward, folded at the waist. My ankles were wrapped around the upright stanchions holding me half on board. My face and shoulders in the rushing water, I twisted my body to face aft. My snorkel just cleared the surface. At first, I only saw a stream of bubbles from the boat's wake. I put out my hand to block the water trailing off the Gracias, and my view cleared. Now I could get a closer look. They were even more elegant underwater. In a rich blue background lit by the direct noon sun, the whole school of them were swimming toward me, dark gray forms spotted with sunlight, dipping and diving with the flows. Their powerful tails propelled them smoothly in any direction they chose. They shot up toward the surface, and upon re-entry spun their entire bodies around, somersaulting in a complete circle, maybe even two just for the fun of it. I tried to keep my eye on each of them, to follow their actions and discern one from another, but they were as sly as a pack of magicians, distracting me with their charming moves as they swam about, craftily maintaining their anonymity. Like children at play, they seemed to to completely enjoy themselves and each other. One took a sudden turn to swim out of the pack toward me, wondering at my dangling presence. It came up to me directly, not 12 inches from my mask, and took me in with its strange monocular eye. It seemed to have a slight smile, the way the line of its mouth curled upward. It looked like a friend, not foe. The length of a human, it had a dark gray upper body and a lighter, almost white belly. I must have been a wonder to it, half a human form submerged in its universe, traveling along at a brisk eight knots with no effort at all on my part. After a moment of swimming alongside, studying me, it seemed to give a nod of acknowledgement, then zipped ahead. 
I twisted forward in time to see it do a complete somersault, allowing perfect timing for the pod to catch up, whereby it was scooped back into our moving party under the sea. They continued on with the gracias, full of vim and vigor, mindless of the hour or distance they traveled. It felt like no time had passed at all, but my knees and ankles began to ache, and my hunger had returned. It was long past lunchtime. I waved what felt like a lackluster goodbye in the midst of their natural grace and hauled myself up. It has been said that a porpoise is akin to man in his intellect. After witnessing this, I would agree. They moved with the precision of any military corps and had impeccable timing. They're joyful creatures, too. Never before had I seen wild animals let loose like sailors on leave in a dance hall. They spun and jumped and danced among themselves for no reason but for the pure joy of it. Within the pod, I also sensed a genuine affection. They didn't compete. I heard no arguing or grumbling among them either. They were happy with themselves and each other. Their warmth and companionship filled the water like the joy of a church congregation singing a happy hymn, hearts light and full of affection. What a state to live in. As far as I could tell, the Gracias had held her course, and we were still headed north by northwest. At sunset, I brought out my sextant. My guess was right. We had traveled a direct path for 11 hours today. The Gracias flew perfectly straight, even as I hung my head in the sea. The quick twilight of the equator fell around me as I hastened to string up my new hammock between the main mast and the rail at the bow. I climbed in with my flashlight and book. Wrapped in a blanket, I opened Flash, the lead dog, my childhood favorite. It never failed to entertain me with its tale of two young men and their adventures crossing the Canadian wilderness. Here their ambition led them to travel by dog sled and on foot through great valleys and across vast plains of snow and ice in search of game and valuable furs. In the blackest of deep winter nights, they relied only on the stars and themselves for survival. They slept in makeshift berths dug in deep pockets of snow lined with pine boughs and layers of animal skins. My bed at sea was quite fair by comparison. Here I lay, strung up in a hammock of my own making, swaying in the temperate breeze out on the open water with a full view of the constellations above. Content with my day and unconcerned about the future, I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep beneath the stars. You know, that's just beautiful. Uh, if you just tuned in, that's a section just read from the author, Malia Bolin, of Left at Hiva Oa, um, talking about her father. And um, you know what? You had to have had that experience because you couldn't have, you had to have gone out with the dolphins, right? You oh, can, I have. Yeah, yes. I could yeah. tell <laughs> that you, it was an actual experience. Yeah. Another thought occurred as I was listening to it. Um, you know, I don't know if you've done it or thought of it, but um, a lot of people like audiobooks now. Yes. Are you going to record it as an audiobook? I would love to. I have not investigated how to do that. Just there, there are rather strict standards, but you know, um, I love listening to you read this, and I think you'd make a very good audiobook. A lot of people do it now for certain reasons. One is they, a lot of people have long commutes and they like to listen. Yes. Um, other other people like to listen um, before they go to sleep at night. It puts them to sleep, you know, listening to something like that. And, mm-hmm. and it is different hearing someone read a book, especially the author, versus just reading in your own mind because you actually capture your voice and the way you, you read it. Um, I get to picture it again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm working. I did my first audio. Um, I'm still working on getting it out, but I, I I've got five books out. And I decided to go back, and um, I just uh, How to Fly with Less Stress, I just okay. read, and I'm going to have mm-hmm. to make sure it's very, very audio-specific. I even bought a mic that's, you, in other words, we ha- we're in a studio right now. There's noise in here. You couldn't do it in the studio. It's right. too noisy. You can hear the computers and everything, yeah. uh-huh. and outside noise. So you have to make sure there's no outside noise. I actually was getting up at 3 and 4 in the morning and recording so there wouldn't be outside noise. Right. And I, I put a little microphone in my closet, and it, it, it's good because you can actually have clothes on either side, and it deadens the outside noise, <laughs> sure. and I made sure there was no outside noise, and I'd cut it over if I didn't. You just do it, you know, like um, sections, you know, every day. Yeah. Mm, you can read for about – you can't read as long as you can write because your voice sure. and everything gets tired. Yeah. You can do about an hour, hour and a half usually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd recommend thinking about it, yeah. you know. If you're interested, yeah. we could work on that together. Yeah. But I think it would be a very good thing. Yeah. It was lovely hearing you read it, and I love some of your descriptions. I mean, I'm wondering when you put some of those interesting uh, adjectives I never would have thought of in there. Is that something you did in the edit or the re-edit, or was that originally? Sometimes your descriptions had lovely 
um, unusual, which sure. makes it a good writing, right, yeah. thing is, did you decide to put some of those unusual descriptions in afterwards? I think it was probably a combination of both. This chapter, I would say, was a little more inspired than maybe some of the others in terms of, I did feel like I was out there mm -hmm. with the dolphins. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never hung my head in the ocean to watch them, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I do, you know, have a sense of what they're like out in the water. And I, I worked on this, I went back in a few times, but... Um, it was a really fun one. It sounds like it. Yeah. And I didn't know you could do because you know what? I, I've only been on a couple times in small boats. Yeah. And I didn't even know you could do something like that. I, I don't know, know if you can either, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be fun. I thought if he's out here for 27 days, yeah. like, and this is kind of at the beginning, so he's not anxious yet or worried or uh -huh. that comes a little later. But I thought if he's out there having fun and mm -hmm. could you – Put your, you know, reef the sails so they're controlled, they're smaller, and they're not, um, he didn't have to worry about that so much, and lock the tiller so we're going in a straight line, and then... See, now that, that's where it comes in handy that you knew how to sail. Well, I don't, I mean, I really learned all of this stuff in the last three years in really? terms of, like, the YouTube videos. <laughs> really? And so I just imagine, could you do that? And so, and I didn't specifically ask anyone, any sailing folks, but I had several beta readers with this book, and several of them know how to sail. And no one came back to me and said, that's crazy, that would never, no one would ever do that. What's <laughs> wrong with explain, this? <laughs> explain to people what a beta readers okay. are. A beta reader is essentially someone, in my understanding, is a friend or someone who's a writer or has some literary experience. Or some of mine were just people I know who like to read. And essentially you ask them to read your book as if any other book. They're not going in there to proofread or do anything like that, but... If they were to pick this off the shelf and read it, what are their thoughts about it? And so I had, they recommend you have four to five when you're putting together a book. Really? I had probably it, 12 to 15. Wow. I see. <laughs> I didn't I know about so this. I've never people. done that. Yeah. And there are people you meet online or friends? Or it what? can be. You know, there's quite a community of writers online. Uh -huh. Mine were mostly friends. Yeah, mostly friends and family members and a couple was of Was your who, mom one of them? <laughs> she was, actually. She was. <laughs> And, you know, and it's always good to check things against people, like, because this takes place in the 50s, 60s, yeah. there's some things that um, I want to make sure is accurate, mm -hmm. right, in the um, culture and environment of that time. Mm -hmm. So so some older people were good to have read it, mm -hmm. and um, a couple sailing people read sailing it. Sailing people, definitely, yeah. yeah. And no one came back and said, well, I got a little, a little <laughs> feedback. Actually, the feedback I got um, was, that was really actually pretty funny in the beginning where there's someone goes overboard mm. and um so the guy who's at the helm at the time says man overboard um aft meaning behind you mm -hmm. know and the feedback from this sailor said man overboard is always aft there <laughs> there is <laughs> behind you <laughs> and i thought okay so maybe that's a little redundant to have him I say it <laughs> I, 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 it's interesting why would that be because no you're going forward and you leave them behind in oh, the water okay. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> right. I wouldn't have thought of that. Of yeah. course they would always be behind. Yeah. So anyway. They're not going to be ahead of you, right? Good point. Right. Now that's a good good catch there. Yeah. And, you know, and I so I changed that because mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to be like what a normal sailor would say. But also what was important to me, and this came through in the editing, was the pace of the, the mm. writing. Mm -hmm. And this probably shows in the chapter I read, but I wanted it to be brisk yeah. and moving along. Yeah. And so extra words like aft, if you don't need it, take it out, you know. Mm. And so um, I, I did a lot of that going through. Also trying to write very much so in the active tense and not the passive tense. Interesting. Good yeah. point. Yeah. And That's, see, the, for novel writing, because I just write poetry or messages and things like that. Or mm -hmm. I've never written a novel. And that seemed like to me the hardest part of doing a novel would be actually how you put the sentence in with the comma, then in the description after that, the narrative. I didn't understand how you do that. And, and was that difficult, doing that? And making it flow where you don't have to, because you're not allowed to do it too much where the person's talking, right? You always right. have to kind of bring it back to, and I wouldn't know how to do that at yeah. all. You know, I just, I don't know how to do it either. <laughs> I just <laughs> went for it. <laughs> You know, I think my dad was a great storyteller. Oh, you was know, he? And just okay. verbally, you know, like sitting around uh -huh. the dinner table. And 
I don't. I think I channeled a little bit of that. In I was writing wondering. This. Do you, I know and, that it can happen when you're writing yeah. that you actually do mm-hmm. get that sense of someone's psyche mm-hmm. and their spirit. And, and you yeah. did you did you feel that 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 did happen that you were able to tune tune into his energy on this book? Yeah, I really had to, like I said earlier, you know, kind of put myself in his shoes. But um, some ideas and visions would come to me that I don't know where they came from, mm-hmm. you know. And so, and I don't know if who knows, maybe a lot of this stuff really did happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so that's really interesting. But where I really felt his um, presence the strongest was the first time I ordered a proof from Create Space, and it came in the mail. And that day, I had been running around. You know, I have two different jobs, and I'd been at one, and then I came home and started working on the other thing. And here was this package in the mail, and I knew what it was, mm-hmm. but I had things to do before I could sit down and open it. Right. And it was just a deadline that night. You know, just things I had to do. And when I finally did, it was like the world stopped. Like everything just got quiet. Mm -hmm. And and I saw the cover of the book and I just felt like, (laughs) yeah, it was so exciting. And and from then, I really felt like um, just this very strong sense of appreciation to him for Mm. doing all the things he did, telling us the stories he did, Mm. um, being that adventurous person and instilling that spirit, you know, in Were you able to use the stories he gave you and told you in the book? Yeah. So most of the stories that he told us that are in there are um, childhood, college, you know, things, mm-hmm. things like that and, and beyond. And then it's just the part where he was sailing for those 27 days that I didn't have a lot of information and I really had mm-hmm. to, you know, get creative. <laughs> okay. I'm very curious since I know your mother, Jennifer. Yeah. What did she, I mean, she must have been thrilled when she actually saw the galleon. I'm sure you gave it to her to read, right? Yeah. yeah. What did she think? She was very excited. She, um, I think she sat up all night and read through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and and did she actually feel you captured it? Yeah. She, she, she was very proud of me and, um, and felt like, wow, what an imagination. Like, where, where did you come up with some of this <laughs> stuff, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, it was neat. I I just think it's thrilling. Um, it was funny at the beginning, right before we started talking, you said, "Well, I don't know, you know, if I can talk for fifty three <laughs> minutes." It's like, I, I, and I said, "Well, I, I have a feeling. I have a feeling you'll be able to." You know? Right. And here it is, fifty two minutes. Okay. Later, wow. So. No, and I mean, but that's also that's part of the story, and that's part of the enthusiasm, and. I, this this is just such a, a beautiful thing, and there is a supportive community here on Maui. Absolutely, of of writers, um, and 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 so I I want that community to get behind this and and get it. I'm, I guess the best place is Amazon. Sure. Do you have a website as well? I do. It's maliabolan.com. dot com. Um, That's spelled M A L I A, B O H L I N Maria Bolin dot com. If you're listening, because this is going to go out to the world as well. Mm-hmm. MariaBolin.com. It's it's a wonderful book, and um, as a first adventure into writing, um, how thrilling <laughs> to have your first book out there. Nice and then day. it's like, how do you follow this up? <laughs> right. Well, I have another story uh, uh-huh. about his mom. So in some of his paperwork from the Navy, oh, I found some history about the mom and um, that. You want me to share? Well, we only have now 30 <laughs> seconds. That's going to have to be another whole well, I'll show. I'll come back another time. It's going to have yeah. to be when you have that book started yes. or going. I'm working. Well, this past November, I started working on it. How exciting. <laughs> How so? It's so thrilling. It really is. I, I am just so happy for you. And um, it's just beautiful seeing that reality. There's nothing quite like seeing your book in print. Absolutely. And Absolutely. being able to say, Maria Bolin, author. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. know, isn't it something? It's like, it is. author, yes, yes. It's a reality, and it's inspired you enough to do another, which is the hardest thing. It's because you know it's really working if you do that, because some people go, I can't do that again. Right. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. It's been wonderful talking. We want to wish everyone a very happy new year, and thank you so much for listening. Aloha.